Uh, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see everyone here, particularly my karaoke colleagues from last night. Uh, yeah, it was a great night. So uh, if anyone doesn't know about it, fantastic karaoke bar, only 12 minutes walk from here, um, maybe later. But for this morning, we are here to talk about open collaboration and our lizard brains. So first of all, um, who am I and why am I standing up here? Well, um, my name is Claire. I'm uh, the executive director of Inner Source Commons. Some of you may be familiar with Inner Source. Anna mentioned it yesterday. It's the it's the uh, adoption of inner source, sorry, open source practices and culture behind a firewall within organizations. Um, I'm also working with OSPO++, uh, which is an organization that promotes the creation of open source program offices in universities and public sector organizations. Um, I'm a co-founder of Open Ireland Network, which promotes uh, open source, use of open source at a national level in Ireland. Um, and I'm also involved in the inner source special interest group um, in the FINOS, or the Financial Services Open Source Technology Foundation. Um, now, here is a picture of me with my dog Archie. He's a wonderful Westie, love him. Um, this picture was actually taken in an effort to get a photo of my dog looking at the camera. I spent 10 minutes trying to get the dog looking at the camera. Um, and I think there's a lesson in here about this photo uh, that actually is relevant for today, which is um, a dog's going to do what a dog's going to do. And that is often not what you want it to do. And if you put a Westie in close proximity to your face, all it's going to do is lick your face. That's what it's going to do. Um, and uh, so lesson here, don't try to make someone do what they're not naturally inclined to do. But what I do want to say is I am not a psychologist, nor am I a neuroscientist. Um, I have a deep interest, though, in open collaboration, in the how it works, why it works, and what is it that makes some people better at open collaboration than others? And I suppose of all the organizations I mentioned before, the one thing that joins them all is that they're all trying to get people to do open collaboration more effectively. So, I mean, why would you want to do that? Because collaboration is good, right? We all agree that. I know I'm speaking to the, the converted here, but like collaboration is really good from an individual perspective. It is good from in terms of actually getting social support. It's good for creativity, for innovation, for learning, for reducing stress. It's good for all those reasons at an individual level. But from an organizational level, it's also really, really good. I mean, it's been proven to increase productivity of teams, to increase problem-solving abilities, to increase, improve communications between people, and fundamentally to create a kind of social cohesion, which is often the health measure of healthy organizations, right? So if you want your organization to work well, you want people to stay there, you want them to be productive, you want to have collaboration effectively working within those organizations. So if it's good for the individual and it's good for the organization, it might make you question, why isn't everyone doing it all the time? Why aren't we all striving to be great open collaborators all the time? Um, and the answer is sometimes it's all about the idea of a culture change challenge because we have been actually, um, I suppose, conditioned to work in a very competitive environment in organizations. So for years, it's all been about competition. It's about competition for the end user, competition for customers, competition between divisions for budget allocation, contribution, or sorry, con con competition between individuals to get the biggest promotion, to get more wages. It's like they've, they've conditioned us to act in a competitive manner. And that is not conducive to collaboration. So if you want to actually fundamentally look at culture change, changing from a competitive culture to a collaborative culture, well then what are the elements of culture change? Now for this, I'm going to take uh, inspiration from a book by the brothers Chip and Dan Heath called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. Really good book, recommend it. Um, and they talk about the kind of three main areas of culture change. One is that you need clear direction from the top. You need to know where you're going. You need to know what it looks like when you get there. Um, in our case, with open collaboration within organizations, you kind of need leadership buy-in. You need to understand what needs to be done, where you're going to, what success looks like. Secondly, you need motivation. You need the people to really want to do this and a kind of intrinsic motivation to make it work, um, giving them a sense of purpose, providing positive reinforcement, all those ideas around the idea of motivating the individuals to get this sort of thing working. 
And lastly, you need to, what the Heath brothers call, shape the path. You need to remove any obstacles, you need to create the processes, give them the tools to make open collaboration work. And for all these things, um, that is often what a lot of folks in the open source or inner source uh, communities, they're all about the idea of making sure those processes are clear and that's happening. So when I'm thinking about the, the inner source community, we often have a lot of folks who've already done this. They, they've, they've done a lot of work to shape the path. They've documented the processes, they've put the tools in place. They have everything that's needed for a team to start doing inner source or open collaboration. They often have leadership buy-in. Often there has been a declaration from the top down going, this is great, we're on this future of work trend, we love this open collaboration thing, go to it, set to with the open collaboration. But oftentimes there's a lot of discussion around if we have this in place and we have leadership buy-in, why isn't it working? And it comes often down to this idea of motivation. How do you get individuals, individuals intrinsically motivated to collaborate in an open way? And so I'm going to take you back now to October, where we at Intersource Commons had what we called the spectacular event, where we had uh, a number of people come and tell us their horror stories, their anti-patterns. There was a lot of gruesome tales of pain and anger and suffering and a little bit of blood, no blood, I'm only messing. But the point was that there was a lot of tales of things that go wrong. And we heard there a number of what I would call kind of archetype type stories that we hear a lot in Intersource Commons. One, for example, was the idea of the wizard developer, the expert developer who's sitting there, he's built his code. It's not usually a him, I'm going to gender this, but the point is that it's, it, it's, you know, they're sitting there, they've built their code, they really have a sense of protection and ownership over that code. They're incredibly proud of it. They may have been there for years, long, long time. They're the people that everyone looked to and go, Ooh, we can't fire them. They're like indispensable. And, and they're sitting there going, why would I show people my code? First of all, chances are that if they even showed the people the code, that no one would even understand it anyway, because possibly it hasn't been documented terribly well. But the point is, these folks, these types of folks, oftentimes have a great resistance against actually sharing what they've done. Second type of, I'll say, stereotype within the, the discussions about what goes wrong are this idea of misguided middle management. And we heard Wolfgang tell some stories about that yesterday. But the idea is that these often maligned group of people um, can often be blockers when it comes to open collaboration. So we hear stories about grassroots development movements where everyone's wanting to do the open collaboration. They see the point, they want to work together, they want that social cohesion, the connectedness, all the rest of it. And then management comes down and goes, the computer says no, because my budget allocation says no, and I am telling you right now, don't go outside your guardrails, please work on your own code. So a lot of people are you know, identifying with this idea of middle management actually blocking open collaboration. Now I'll say now, they often get bad stick, right? You know, like everyone's saying, middle management, they're pretty bad in the open collaboration space, but they are often reflecting organizational constraints that have actually been put in place, and they're really reacting to perhaps incentives that have been given to them to maybe act in a different way. Now, the last area, and I'm gonna, this one was one of my favorites. Uh, it was uh, brought to us by our friends at the BBC. They, they came up with the term, but you may have heard of test-driven development. You may have heard of data-driven development, but have you heard of mortgage-driven development? Uh, which is the idea that there are some people whose main priority in life is just to keep their jobs. And so they are motivated by the idea that I need everyone to need me to be the only person who can actually change this code. Because if I'm not the only person who can change this code, um, my job might be on the line. Um, and I may lose my job, lose my ability to pay my mortgage, and therefore all my decisions are framed in that context. Um, so these are types of, I suppose, stereotypical situations that you might come across within an organization, which leads to a motivation that's other than open collaboration. So right now, I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment, right? I'm going to get you all to stand up, please. You can do a bit of a stretch if you like. Try not to punch your neighbor, right? Stand up. It's morning. I know it is. Take a deep breath. Woo! This is good, right? Now, stay standing if you think you're a pretty rational human being who makes rational decisions. And sit down if, for the most part, you don't make rational decisions. 
Interesting, a group of pretty rational people. Well, I can tell you right now that you can all the rest of you sit down too, because the fundamental thing is we think we are rational beings. We're all terribly logical. We have amazingly intelligent brains capable of problem solving at a high degree of complexity, but we actually do not make rational decisions all the time. Now, I'm going to bring you to a person called Daniel Kahneman. Has anyone heard of Daniel Kahneman? He won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2002 for economics. Um, he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and it's all about how our brain works and makes either rational decisions or irrational, emotionally-led decisions. So it's about how, fundamentally, we think we are rational beings, but actually we are blind to our blindness. We neither make rational decisions, we're not even, we don't, we have very little idea of how little we actually know, and we're not even designed to know how little we know. So we're not even aware of the fact that our brains work in a certain way. That means that this rational bit of our brain rarely gets engaged on a general basis, if you're thinking about like 24 hours. One model that I found that helps me understand this is called the triune brain model. It was brought, to, brought out by a neuroscientist called Paul McLean back in the 1980s. And it is about the idea that our brain can be considered to have evolved over time, starting with the reptilian brain right at the top of our brainstem here, which is about um, unconscious or emotions or um, instincts. So like when we're back in dinosaur ages and cyber tooth tiger comes along, what do we do? We run. You know, you don't sit there going, I think I need a strategy plan for the cyber tooth tiger, tiger attack. You actually see the tiger and you run and that's, or you fight, whatever you want to do. But the point is, you don't have to think about it. Then came the limbic system, or the emotional feeling brain, which is where, that's where our emotions are processed. And then, lastly, evolved the human side, or the, the bit of the brain that's associated with humans, or the neocortex, which is where a lot of our rational thinking, conscious thinking happens. Now, the triune brain model has actually fallen out of favor because it's a little bit oversimplistic. So it's not true to say that our brain evolved in these like three-layered models. Um, also, there's been proven fact that even lizard-type you know, animals or birds may actually have uh, brain activity that spans the, the, the three areas. So it's not incredibly accurate as a model for a brain, but it's a really good way to explain the difference between what is essentially a kind of a primal instinct and what may have evolved as kind of rational, deep, complex thought. So when I talk about the lizard brain, I'm talking about the bits that are associated with that reaction to the cyber-toothed tiger, how we've evolved to actually do things in a very quick manner. And the thing is that evolution has made us cognitive misers. We want, at all times, to actually save energy. That's what we're designed to do. If we had to make a rational decision when anything new came our way, when we had to come down the stairs and decide what to eat for breakfast, when we had to actually land in a new city and find the building, if we had to, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but yesterday when I was trying to get here in the rain and I was wandering around the courtyard outside, it caused a lot of cognitive load. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to find the event? If we had to do that for every minute of the day when we're deciding what color socks to wear, we would be exhausted before we get downstairs in the morning. So we have spent a lot of time evolving a way in which we spend as little, possible, as little time as possible in the rational, complex thought part of our brain, and as quite a lot of time, actually, making these snap decisions that actually help us just get through the day in an efficient manner. Oh, I forgot to build the slides. So basically, we have uh, anything that requires decision-making, you know, ambiguity requires significant cognitive load that actually is exhausting. And our priority as humans is to conserve energy and to be more efficient with our brain power. And we've evolved these idea of mental shortcuts to help us do that. So most of you will be familiar with the idea of, oh, sorry, before I do that, when we think about these shortcuts, we, and, and the way Daniel Kahneman would talk about it, is like that there's two systems for decision making. And what's interesting is our brain rarely, you can't do the two things at once. You're either doing a kind of an automatic decision-making process, or you flip into this thinking, high-energy kind of process. System one, or unconscious emotion, decisions are very fast, they're often involuntary, and they associate things, so they're based on learnings that we've had in the past. System two, it's more slow, it's controlled, it follows rules, and that's the more complex cognitive piece of our brain. 
So the one that thing that we are probably most familiar in this case would be biases or cognitive biases. So when I started looking into biases, I didn't quite realize how many there are. There are at least 188 cognitive biases that have been identified. You can't read them here, but I would recommend following the link to actually have a look at this um, codex because it's just fascinating. Um, but just to give you an idea, they're kind of broken down into shortcuts about what we should remember. So what, what we should remember. Um, when we have too much information, which is pretty much all the time, these days, any day, right? There's so much input in our world, then we actually take shortcuts to manage that. Um, oftentimes, we need to act fast. We can't deliberate and go into analysis paralysis on every question that comes our way, so we often have to make snap decisions. Um, and oftentimes, we react to not having enough meaning in our world. So we tend to, make, to assign meaning to things where meaning may not be there, because that's just the way our brain works. So examples of this might be, um, in terms of we need to act fast, we might favor the immediate thing that's relatable in front of us. So whatever is most familiar to us or what we've seen last is often impacting our brain and how it works. We imagine things or people that we're familiar with or fond of as better. And that's the whole idea of the us and them thing, right? So when we know someone, we just think they're better because we're fond of them, we're familiar with them. That's a brain shortcut we have. We notice things that are primed already in our memory. So the more often we hear something, the more th true we think it is, whether or not it's true or not. Right? So if we've heard things something once, because uh, this happens to be the first time you've had a presentation on open source software and its benefits, versus you're going to FOSS backstage every year and you're pretty much embedded in the whole idea that open source is good and open collaboration is good, well, one thing is more likely to be true for us than the other scenario. No, neither of them may actually be related to whether it's true or not. It just happens that we hear one thing more often and one thing we hear less often. And, and also, we store memories based on the emotions that were present when we experienced them. Um, so emotions are very tied to how we remember things. And the biggest emotion is fear, right? If we are fearful, that is hugely impactful on our brain. Now, fear and the threat response basically activates what's called our amygdala back here. And it's part of that lizard brainy type of area. And basically, when we feel like there's a threat present, say a cyber-toothed tiger comes through the door, and we all are pretty scared, then we activate this part of our brain for threat response. And what happens is that our body gets flooded with these um, adrenaline, cortisol, terribly dangerous to have in, in high um, percentages for a long time, but it makes our pupils dilate and, you know, freeze up our arteries to get the blood running. We are ready to fight, flight, or freeze. So we're either going to take them on, that tiger, or we're going to run away, or we're literally just going to freeze and go, hope he doesn't notice me. <laughs> so the idea is that that is built into us as a reaction to threat. Um, and it's also known as the amygdala hijack, where that part of your brain takes over your brain. Um, because you can't have rational thoughts when those sort of things are flooding your body. We are designed not to actually start thinking about things. Now, what's interesting is there's a model called David, Scarf's, David Rock's sorry, Scarf model. He came up with this in the early 2000s. Um, and what's really interesting about this framework is that David Rock identified that social threats are responded to in almost exactly the same way as physical threats. And the five main areas, or the framework in which we can consider this, is called SCARF. And the areas are status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And if those are ideas, our perceptions of what these things mean, are threatened in any way from a social perspective, we activate our threat response in our body. So what can that look like? Well, status perceived loss of power, respect, social standing, certainty, anything that's were ambiguous, uh, unpredictable, a lack of information, autonomy, anything that is a loss of control or a sense of being forced to do something against your will, relatedness, social rejection, criticism, exclusion, fairness, perceived unfair treatment, bias or injustice. Now, I don't know about you, but when I learned about this model, I was like, ha, huh, that's what's been happening. All this time, I've been doing digital transformation consulting for God knows how long. And every time I go in, I'm like, it's going to be brilliant. I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're, everything is going to change. It's going to be amazingly innovative. What you used to do in the past, that's a no-no. What we're going to do now is this hugely 
evolving, unspecific set of things that are coming down the line, your team is going to change, great efficiencies, we're going to have rationalization, typically means people being cut. We're going to bring in all these new people who knew about technology, maybe some robots, because they're all very handy in this sort of thing. And, and it's all going to be fantastic, and don't worry about it, because everyone's going to be coming out fine. The organization is going to be great. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm like, looking at this, I'm triggering every single one of these things. And then you wonder why you're in these meetings and people are like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that, you know? And, and, and the reaction can be very extreme. So when we say, let's collaborate with inner source, what are people actually thinking? We're saying, it's great, open collaboration, social cohesion, everyone's happy. What may they be thinking? Well, they may be thinking, what is, this is my code, I created it, are others going to take credit for it now? Or maybe they're thinking, how is this all going to work? You know, how will I know who's going to contribute? How are things going to get prioritized? What's really going to happen? Or maybe they're thinking, am I going to control things now? I mean, if everyone's going to be collaborating with me, what does that mean for my deadlines and my priorities? Am I going to be face forced to change how I work? What if people think I'm bad at this? What if they criticize my code? What, who's going to take credit for all this now? You know, when I go into my promotion discussions, how am I going to say or prove what I did versus what other people did? Now, I don't know about you, but these questions get asked all the time when we talk about InnerSource. And if you put it in this model, you can maybe start to see why these things get, get, get asked. And fundamentally, this is leading to perhaps very fearful responses in people. So when we say something that logically, rationally makes sense, open collaboration is great, we all agree, we've had the studies to show it, they're not hearing that. They're feeling all these things, which basically means that we have a lizard brain trigger alert, and it has now taken over their ability to have rational thinking. And what happens? You have three responses. You have people who fight, people who flight, fly away, um, or people who freeze. So what does that really look like in reality? Well, sometimes with the fighting, you can get pushback, you can get aggression. I mean, no one's ever tried to actually thump me in a meeting, but you know, I've seen clenched fists, all right. Um, you have this kind of passive aggressiveness, defensiveness, all these kind of feelings coming out. You can have avoidance. You can have people kind of going, actually, I don't want to hear this. It's not really of interest to me. Disinterest, maybe I'm not uncertain about this. Maybe blocking actions where people are actually saying, no, I don't really feel this much. Or you can have procrastination, inaction, people saying that they're going to just delay this. Let's, I mean, I know this is important, but maybe we'll push it out to next quarter. We'll just have a think about whether this is important or not. A lot of analysis paralysis. And these reactions, again, may not actually be logical, rational things. They may be decisions that are made in the spur of the moment based on what essentially is a physical lizard brain response. So, remember... Reactions are often involuntary. Rational arguments in this case doesn't work. Now, also, this feeling, the actual flooding of the brain, can last anything from minutes where you have an initial reaction. And depending on the strength of the actual reaction, it can last hours. So remember, this is not just a minute-by-minute -minute thing. People's uh, cognitive ability may be impaired for actually hours as a result of this. So what do you do? You need to minimize the threats. You need to acknowledge them and work to address concerns. What you don't do is go, middle management, always knew they were stupid. You know, let's, you know, so that, that, for example, doesn't help alleviate the, the conversation whatsoever, right? So when, when you're actually sitting in a place where everything is familiar to you, where you're feeling comfortable with the concept, and you're looking at people for whom this is new, for whom it could be scary, don't judge them. But you have to acknowledge their feelings that might be actually legitimate feelings. We laughed at the mortgage-driven development. Look around you. What's happening in the world today? Lots of people are losing their jobs. It is a valid concern. And when we talk about open collaboration, it isn't always sunshine and roses and unicorn and rainbows. Like, oftentimes, you've got two teams doing the same thing. They get rationalized. Rationalized. What actually happens? People do lose their jobs. So these are valid concerns that people have, and we have to acknowledge them. But there is an opportunity, because it's not all bad. Because I showed you the SCARF model before. We talked about the, the you know, threat response that happens in your brain. What's really interesting is there's another response, and it's the reward response. So with the exact same framework, you can actually trigger a love response. Because what gets happens when those areas get rewarded? We release in our body dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins. What are they? The same 
fe- drugs that you get when you fall in love, or eat chocolate, but fall in love. So the point is that you can actually literally bypass rational thought and get people to fall in love with ideas by actually positively reinforcing these areas. So again, when I look at this framework and I think about the patterns that we may have in inner source commons that we talk about a lot, you can actually literally list these against the areas in SCARF. You can talk about the emphasis on recognition and praise and um, you know, helping people feel good about their stuff. This isn't just a good idea because it's nice to do on the side. It's because it actually helps people feel positive about their status in their life and their social circumstances. We talk about leadership buy-in, we talk about documentation, mentoring, we talk about all these things that help people have clarity around what's going to happen and takes away ambiguity. We talk about autonomy, we want to not just give people autonomy in terms of the code they participate and collaborate in, but you want to give them autonomy in rolling out the process. You want to engage them to help them understand that they're part of actually creating these processes that they're going to be doing in the future. And you have to watch out for blanket enforcements. So we've had a couple of instances where people, someone from the top down says, from tomorrow, everyone's doing inner source. And you're like, no one's thought to address any of the other things. That can literally cause that fear response we talked about. So watch out for that. You want to give opportunities for creating connections. That's why events and online forums and hackathons and events like this are so important, because creating relationships is really key to actually creating this really positive uh, emotional response. And you want to make sure that it feels fair. And this is really important. And I think more and more we're beginning to realize that it's very hard to get these sort of things rolled out in a systematic scaling fashion if you haven't got some sort of complementary incentive process within the organization. Because if you've got someone who's saying, you know, I'm going to reward you for what you produce on this bit of code, and you're trying to get them to actually help collaborate on other pieces of code, it's just not going to work fundamentally in the long term. So you need alignment between incentive models um, and, uh, and what you're trying to do in terms of open collaboration. And of course, if you are measuring that, you do have to watch out for metric gaming, because that's often what happens in the, in the end if you're not careful, and it really can help make people feel that things are unfair. So that helps people feel very, very happy and brings a little bit of love into the equation, which is really, really good. So takeaways. Number one, our lizard brains are incredibly powerful. If you think you make rational decisions all the time, you are wrong vast majority, and I'm talking like high, high 90s percentage of the decisions you make in your brain every day is happens automatically. It doesn't require conscious thought. Reactions are involuntary. You cannot talk your way out of this. You cannot explain and hand academic papers to talk about the value, business benefits of open collaboration if people are triggered in this way. Um, so they don't work. Uh, rational arguments. It can last. Be careful about that because sometimes you need just to give people time to get over an emotional reaction and maybe they're a little bit more open to rational arguments an hour or two down the line. So maybe don't try and land it on them all at once if they're feeling triggered. And use SCARF. It's a fantastically powerful framework to do a checklist in your brain about the emotional responses to change. Um, And again, think about it in the context of minimizing the threats and maximizing the rewards. And if we do that, maybe, just maybe, we'll have less scared of cyber tiger type reactions and more love for open collaboration. So that's uh, that's my talk. And I want to say a big thank you all for listening and to say thank you to the organizers here today because Fast Facts Day certainly brought a bit of love into my heart. (laughs) Karaoke people too. Love that. Thank you. Um, Really appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks, Claire. That was really insightful. I think uh, it will give us a couple of tools to deal with this situation. So, are there any questions? Or is everything really clear? I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Anybody? Um, Just a second. How do you apply uh, this? Oh, hold on. For the people online. In, in practice, um, how, how do you apply these things when you go to a company that has, is really struggling with uh, like ad- adopting this? They, are they coming towards you and uh, say, all right, with some management level things, this would be cool? 
um, but the whole company culture is against it. Or, or like, what are the, how do you deal with the challenges in practice? Well, I think so. I mean, from my personal perspective, a lot of these kinds of, um, I suppose, signals that that are that I listed here um, often come up in the discussions that we have in Inner Source Commons when we when we're, because we're a community of practitioners and folks are talking about, well, this is what's happening, right? I'm, I'm getting this kind of response. Um, here is my horror story. Um, and, and folks then are, are basically trying to discuss how to actually, what are the patterns, what are the ideas and experiments we can do to actually alleviate those issues. Um, and I suppose from my perspective, it, it's just important to be able to frame, if, if you recognize something that's happening in, like this, you might just want to think, is it because of this fear response? And if so, the, the kind of, you know, why collaboration is good is not really going to address those fears. So you have to actually then explore that with the individuals who are suffering from this or, you know, experiencing this. Um, and then to look to what are the potential mitigations? Do they have leadership buy-in and support where they can perhaps in, in implement some incentive program that can help? If not, maybe they need to try other things that are like, I mean, we had an example of people who created their own inner source trophy. I mean, create it like with a hammer and nails. It was like an ugly looking thing, but people loved it, right? And like you handed it out to teams and that was enough for to give that feeling of status and reward and fairness. So it doesn't have to be a corporate incentive program, but you need to look at ways in which you can actually mitigate against, minimize that feeling that, something, that something's impacting negatively your status and see how you can actually positively impact it. And look at the many, many ways you can do it. Another thing I would say is that some people say, oh, you know, thank you for your contribution is enough. Like that's thanks, that's praise. But we know for a fact that if you double down on that, if you have people who actively spend time going into people's LinkedIn and saying, you're great, blah, 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 or sending emails to their bosses, or there's many, many ways you can appreciate people. And if you do it authentically and you do it consistently and you do it with gusto, it's far more effective than a, you know, always remember to say thank you to a contribution which is fine, but can feel formulaic, not real. And we've seen leaders who are good at that. When they leave a team, the inner source contributions can drop um, simply because that person spent so much time doing that. And sometimes that's kind of hidden work. People don't appreciate it, but it's so important to the actual cohesiveness and the, and the actual celebration of the work in the team. Anybody else? Uh, so I'm part of the open source initiative. So we're all about open source. And uh, of course, you're part of inner source, right? And my question is, do you see, uh, I really like your talk about uh, those fears and how you can address them. Uh, before open source, we had free software. And maybe that's too radical. So, so open source came as a way to make it less radical and like, address those fears? Do you see inner source as a way to address those fears around open source? Maybe a company is not ready to really go deep into open source, but maybe inner source is a way to introduce them to this? What a great segue, but yes, I really do. So, I mean, one of the reasons that InnerSource actually came to be, like InnerSource Commons certainly came to be created, were a number of people whose goal was exactly that, to help create a safe space that felt less fearful for people to be able to practice these collaborative behaviors, but not in the wild per se, where there was a threat of public humiliation if you get it wrong. Um, so in many respects, the whole practice of InnerSource is, in, is to allow for a safe space to be able to master these uh, this process of collaboration, which is what I, like, I mean, open source and inner source, that the processes around that are so powerful because they're actually giving people that clear guidelines, the process by which they can collaborate. So it does fulfill some of that, the ask, but you want to make sure that when people participate for the first time, which is pretty scary, always pretty scary. Who was, Malcolm was saying yesterday, do you feel the fear? I felt the fear when I did my first commit. You're like sitting there going, oh, oh, press the button, press the button. And if it wasn't for the fact that I had an amazing mentor in Inner Source Commons who was literally sitting on Slack waiting for me to say that I pressed the button and ready to support me, I don't know if I would have felt comfortable doing that. So yeah, I, I really do think there's a lot of fear when people get started with these things, particularly if they're experts in their field and now being asked to learn something new, that's a really hard thing for people. That's a really, like, that's a, it, it's almost a threat to your status to hear about a new trend that you have to get your head around, right? Because you're like, you mean I don't know everything? Ooh, you know, or the way I've been working hasn't been perfect. Ooh, you know, so you don't want to hear that. So I think, yeah, inner source can be a safe path. Yeah. 
So we actually also have a, an online question, I think from somebody who's already a bit into inner source. Would it make sense to actually label the inner source patterns with scarf attributes? Ooh, yeah, Ooh. that's a good one. That's huh? an interesting one. Yeah. We'll have to talk about that later, Sebastian. It, it might it might certainly be a nice way to actually kind of think about the problem space. So maybe we can maybe we can tag the problem in that respect to kind of for, certainly for those ones that are, are related to motivations. Um, because we do have a lot of folks who are considering this and have experimented a lot and have some fantastic ideas. Everything from, as I said, homemade trophies to badging and all sorts of things that I know are common as well in the open source community. But yeah, great idea. Yeah, great question and gives us a little more work to do, I yes, guess. Yes, indeed. So any other questions? Yep. So you mentioned that, that you know, over 90% of our decisions that we're doing are non-rational. So do we need to put our own house in order before we start working on yeah. something yeah, collaboratively think, right? at work? So, so like all this like anti-bias training and everything like that, it's been proven to be um, uh, not terribly effective. So, so putting your own house in order, there are practices to do that. Um, it's, it involves things like um, all the, the practices around cognitive behavioral therapy, all of those sort of things. There's various different therapies that help you practice control your emotional response and flip your brain into, like recognize the signals in yourself and then flip your brain into a more rational approach. Um, obviously, I think we should all be doing all, more of that all the time, including myself. There's lots of work to be done there in terms of self-improvement. I guess the point you have to re recognize though is that it's hard and, and most people will not be going on that self-improvement journey. So if you're trying to make open collaboration happen, you can put yourself in order, but it won't, and that might, might help you not decide to like kind of, you know, what do you mean open collaboration is bad? And you're like, open collaboration is great, I'm gonna punch you, ooh. But uh, um, like, stop that, no, that, would, that wouldn't be good. Um, but uh, so it does help if you're not reacting to people because then that just escalates. So that does help. But, um, but fundamentally, I, I, you know, I think that the broader, the broader problem space is that most people are not even aware that this is happening to them. Um, and, and even people who are well practiced can find triggering situations and things that, you know, are just always going to trigger them, you know. So, yeah, great idea. But, but perhaps uh, I wouldn't say it as a, as a necessary uh, step to actually be able to use this for others. Cool. Any other questions? Then there's the inner source meeting. Yes, thank you, Ben, for reminding me. So for those of you who are into inner source, and I know there's a couple of you who have signed up to the inner source gathering, which we're having as a kind of a sidetrack here for the next three hours. Um, if you're interested in coming along to that, we are all going to go together because we don't know where we're going. And Paul is going to bring us, follow Paul, who's waving, uh, bring us to the place where that is happening now. So if anyone is interested in joining us, you don't have to have pre-registered. But if you are, do want to come along. It's an unconference style discussion around the challenges around inner source. Um, and we'd love to see new people there if you fancy coming. So um, other than that, I'll see you later at the break and at lunch. And thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Thank